So here we are with Joseph Sorochi. It's Saturday morning in Australia. It's Friday afternoon in Santa Barbara. And talk about frames. What different frames we're in right now? Joseph, you're, you're in a frame of Saturday morning and I'm in the frame of the end of the day. Weekend's about to come. And I've been learning about you for a while and reading your stuff. But I think that what really enamored me was when I, I was mentioning to you, when I attended your workshop at ACBS, Worldcon last year, and you talked about attachment and the way that you talked about it in your ability to weave in science with these con this contemplative wisdom was so beautiful to me and so inspiring. And so I'm hoping we can talk more about that Absolutely. today. And I think it's super applicable to people's lives yeah. right now. Yeah. I'm glad to hear that. I mean, I'm not always certain that non-attachment is well received in Western cultures. You know, um, a lot of people would argue that non-attachment is the central thing in Buddhism. But, you know, 40 years ago, when people brought East to the Western psychologies, they really focused on mindfulness and not non-attachment. And I, I wonder if that was because you know, we're a bit materialistic, maybe, you know, with mindfulness, you could have mindfulness for business, mindfulness for getting rich. And, you know, it doesn't necessarily uh, imply that you're going to be letting go of possessions, which non-attachment doesn't require. But um, so I'm glad to hear it. I, I actually need to, I, I just don't know how well non-attachment is being received yet. Here, here's how people can receive it. Because I think people can understand it if you, if you bring it to the real day-to-day -day yeah. living. So yeah. here's the example I give with clients, which is, have you ever had a garage sale? And when you take all this stuff from your house that you don't want anymore, and you put it on, you literally put it on the curb and people start to drive by and they start to look at your stuff. And all of a sudden you want to take a few things back. <laughs> I changed my mind. Or people start to look at your stuff and they want to pay a dollar for it. And you're like, wait, no, 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 this, this, this was, this is a $10 item. And then by the end of the garage sale, you still have some stuff left and you card it all up and you take it to Goodwill. So in that moment, you've moved in and out of attachment multiple times. Yeah. And, and we all can relate to that feeling of, of stuff. But I think that sometimes in Buddhism, we, we it gets so like uh, conceptual that we don't understand how we're all caught. Yeah, and that's a really good example. Um, it really kind of suggests that our ego is attached to those objects to some extent, and we don't even know it until we put it out there and somebody offers us a dollar for the most prized, you know, early Batman kind of collectible that now is, you know, being treated as a piece of garbage. Um, so I, I think, yeah, the, I. The, one of the best ways, I think, to talk about non-attachment to the Western audience is to put it in the context of achievement and striving because it sounds like it would be totally opposed to it. So a lot of, a lot of people probably think non-attachment is giving up all your possessions and, and living um, very uh, like just as a poor person. But I think it's much deeper than that and that the giving up the possession is like just one manifestation of letting go of some ego aspect of yourself. Something that's you, like just just as an example, people who hoard, um, typically they are extending their sense of self to those objects that they refuse to get rid of. They they got to honor those objects. They've got to keep them. They they can't just get rid of them because it would be like dishonoring part of themselves or their past. So there is this with humans this ability to verbally extend our sense of self to objects, and then the destruction of the object is almost like the destruction of self, the devaluing of self. And that's just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to ego. Ego, ego is the really the problem here. So it's not just objects. Like objects, you know, we can get attached to a car or we can get attached to a dress or, you know, it sits in your closet. You can't get rid of it because you remembered how it made you feel when you were 20-something. Yeah. But it's more the attachment to the sense of self yeah. that causes the problems. And, yeah. and especially in our in our world where there is so much inflation of the sense of self. Like that's what we're all yeah. kind of living on right now. 
And we're, we're sold that, aren't we? We're sold that you need to have this ultra confident self. You got to believe in yourself. You have to have the right attitude and you have to, you know, unlock the giant within. And it's really reinforcing this idea that first ego, then success. But what if, uh, you know, egos actually opposed to success? And so I think for non-attachment, that's the place to start because people think, oh, I don't want to give up striving. I don't want to give up succeeding. And the paradox is that non-attached people are more successful. They're more effective and successful. So that's, that's really the paradox that people need to get their head around if they're going to understand non-attachment is how can you be more successful if you are not, how can non-striving and striving go together? So tell me about this in a personal way. I want to ask you about the science of it, but the way that you opened your talk yeah. was a personal story. So you're obviously studying this because you relate to it. Ah, uh, yeah. I mean, the thing about ego is you don't know you have it until it gets crushed, you know, <laughs> until somebody treats you as if you are really nothing special. And uh, yeah, I was going through a really uh, tough time in my career um, where, you know, I had been, it'd been smooth sailing. I was really successful and lots of people, when you're an academic, you know, students feed your ego, other academics feed your ego. People tell you you're awesome. You're in this position. So there's a lot of artificial kind of feeders of ego in there. They're not real, mind you. None of this stuff is real. Like you could always ask, well, what am I actually doing for the world? And that's more real than, you know, how impressed are people that I'm an academic. But there, there was a change of the management and suddenly I was not doing the right thing. It was just very sudden from hero to zero, really immediately. And uh, my job was under threat. My whole sense of um, worth as a researcher was under threat, it was one of the most difficult times in my life. It was just, it just destroyed my sense of uh, a self, not in a bad way. I mean, that egoic sense of self as being important or special or somehow as an academic, I was important. Like I realized how quickly and arbitrarily that was being supported by the things around me and it could just be turned off. Boom, it's gone. You know, it was not easy. It was one of the most difficult things I've ever suffered through. Um, and I had to let go of this sense of specialness. And really what it did was as it destroyed my sense of importance and specialness, it fo caused me to really focus on, well, what am I doing in this physical world that's actually good? Because if, it can, if this can just be turned off that quickly, then that's just arbitrary. That's just made up stuff. I've been attached to made up stuff. So how would I know if I was actually doing something no good? And I'll give, a, I'll give an example just the other day. Um, the two, the, the two young kids come from Red Cross and they're actually going door to door collecting donations to help older people, um, to help support older people who maybe have nobody that, who can talk to them. And they go and they call them once a week and they help them with groceries. And these two kids, you know, facing me, this, you know, 54 year old guy, and you could see they're anxious and nervous and, and they're really stressed and they're going through the cell. And I'm just like, I'm just feeling like shame, believe it. I'm like, God, look at the look at the courage of these two kids. They're actually doing something which will physically help these people and putting me to shame, you know. And and it's that sense of when you destroy your when you destroy that egoic self, you can come into contact with actually what is actually affecting the world. And these two young people on that day were affecting the world more than I was. And um you know, that is what I think the destruction of my ego led me to trying to say, okay, I need to, I need to, I hate to use Leonard Skinner as a, as an, as a, but you know, be a simple kind of man is, is a great song. And it, it kind of captures that be something you'll understand, you know, something you'll love and understand. Like, do you understand what you're doing in your life and how you're trying to be good? Not just the idea of being a good person, but actually are your actions actually doing something and, and really getting out of the delusional world of ego and pride and I'm an important person, blah, 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 and chasing likes. We're all chasing likes. I was chasing likes in the academic world to um, pursuing actual change uh, that I could fit, that I could understand simply that I could explain to anybody. And I, I'm, I've been, since the utter destruction, which was incredibly painful, I feel like I've oriented much more towards actual doing decent things that nobody might know about or hear about, you know? Yeah, we have to have that utter destruction multiple times. You know, it's the putting stuff out on the curb. I'm ready to give this all up. And then all of a sudden, oh, I picked it up again. There's my attachment. And it's it's many um, 
distractions. And, you know, in that moment when you were talking about those kids, it made me think about actually one of the barriers to non-attachment is, is shame, yeah. <laughs> interestingly, because I could see mm. that, you know, I'm thinking about clients who get into this shame spiral of, and I'm not doing enough that actually starts to drive more selfing in some yeah. ways. I'm not doing enough and therefore I'm a loser and therefore I don't, I can't do anything. So yeah. it's, it's kind of hard either which way you turn when you start um, seeing yourself as so important. Probably that negative side is the, the flip side of the positive. So you're trying to feel like a good person, like you're doing enough, which is a fine thing to strive for until it gets rigid, until it's like, a, it looks like a parent who, doesn't do anything for themselves because that would make them a selfish person, you know, like that kind of, mm -hmm. but then they're clinging to the perfect, being the perfect parent and, you know, that kind of stuff. Well, tell me about the research behind it, because you've looked at some of the research behind non-attachment and actually how it plays out into our mental health and our well-being. Yeah. One of the things that you talked about in your talk were these four core needs of humans and how attachment actually gets in the way of us meeting those needs. So those needs being things like connection and those needs being things like having a sense of mastery, um, those needs being like have a sense of autonomy, and then also our health needs sort of to, to be healthy. Yeah. How does attachment yeah, get in the way of those needs being met? So, well, with ego, um, let's talk about connection. How would ego get in the way of connection? Well, we know that like that evaluation, I'm important, I'm special, is by definition a zero-sum evaluation. It means for you to be in the light, somebody has to be in the darkness. For you to be important, somebody has to be less important. And so it sets up a competition with others. And I have no problem with comp – there's no problem with competition, but this is a competition over symbols, only people don't realize it like over feeling important and special. And it just, I've seen this happen again and again. It's so sad when it happens. Like people just go to war with each other over things which have no real consequence. Um, trying to think of an example I can use, <laughs> which would be not exposing. I have an example. Oh. Okay, good. So I was just talking about how I left a podcast. Yeah. If you're caught up an ego and competition for the sake of I am special, therefore you are not special, then then your wishes are for that podcast to do poorly yeah. so your podcast can do well. Exactly. But the reality is actually both podcasts can do well. Yeah. They may actually help each other both do better, right? Yeah. And yeah. so we're, we, we're so busy popping other people's balloons and blowing up our own that we don't realize that there's enough air for both. Yeah. And that is so yeah. often true in a modern context that it's not a zero sum game. It's, it's much more of a, I forget what they call the one, a, a joint, like you doing better helps other people do better and vice versa. And that's like 95% of the um, contexts are where you, you, we work together as a collective and, and you're better, you're more creative. Um, that, you know, like in the striving context, like, so this is more like the need for competence there's an interesting pattern amongst people who are very successful and some fall into this trap and some don't. And the pattern is when they're learning and getting started and making the way up, they, they work with other people. They listen to people's advice. They get criticized by other people and they develop. And, and sometimes they, they break through, they write a bestseller or they become really popular. And then at that point, there's a crucial moment where there could be a transition where they then go, oh, this I'm successful because of me because of my, my strengths, my skills, my talents. So they, sh they lose the recognition of their interdependent self with everybody and how much everybody's dependent on it. And in the act world, this is always true. You know, you see how interdependent we are on each other, learning from each other, really open and sharing. And then what can happen as you get to the top is you can make the shift to saying, going from recognizing your interdependence to beginning to think that it's actually you, that you possess the power of greatness. And so you don't need these other people. You no longer need this negative feedback. Actually, what you'll do is you'll start to surround yourself with people who say nice things to you, you know, and, and you'll start to kind of not seek out criticism. You'll start to not look at the problems and, and the limitations. And I think when, if, 
if people fall into that trap, um, they stop growing, they stop developing, they fall behind. And this is not just people who get to be famous. Uh, it could be getting older, you know, getting older, you stop listening to young people. You stop, you start to try and, I mean, I know the temptation. You want to surround yourself with people who are going to tell you what you want to hear. And that's ego. And that is not, that means that your evolution is going to stop and sometimes go backwards because things are changing so fast that all the things that you were awesome at are now obsolete, you know, by the time in five years. So you've got to have that constant, I think for me, letting go of ego and pride means you're able to kind of receive feedback, be wrong and be part of this interconnected network of humans who make you better and you make them better. But the minute you start to separate it off and say, no, this is me. This isn't, I'm, I'm like an important person. You start to disconnect from that interdependent self. You think you are anyways, and you stop growing. So that that's another way, the separate ego. Yeah. Yeah. I was talking to my dad this morning and he just got back from a, a 28 day retreat in Spirit Rock. And it's a you know sort of silent retreat where you, you said everyone gave up their cell phones and this like a bunch of like sixty year olds that are like oh I can't give up my cell phone yeah <laughs> and whenever he comes back he's like this wise being and I love talking to him because he's yeah. got so much he's just so non selfie and yeah, yeah. and I was talking about this concept and what he said was interesting he was giving me some advice I wrote it down because I was taking notes while he was talking yeah he so loves that I'm taking notes on his. Now, Gosh, I wish my kids would pay attention to what I'm saying. <laughs> oh, I didn't pay attention to my. So I will tell you, my rebellion from my dad was that I went into yoga because he was a Buddhist. But That'll be <laughs> now I see his ways. But he yeah. um, he said the people that that I want to be around are people that are not stuck in their view, people that can yeah. see other people's views. How much are they telling you what they know versus how they're living their life? Yeah, that's a big difference. And how much are they? emanating and embodying like when you yeah. are around them you feel it embodying what they are teaching because he said you know there's a lot of people teaching these concepts yeah. but they're not embodying them and in some ways that's part of the selfing so he was giving me some advice there he was like you know slow down diana start embodying it and make sure you're teaching what you're living absolutely i mean there's can be a lot of politics and infighting in an ashram right and you know, some of the worst criticisms I've, I've heard for academic writing in this area has been from Buddhists who like unfair criticism. So being a Buddhist or being a mindfulness practitioner or having all the labels, you know, it doesn't inherently mean that you've actually embodied that and embodying it's actually much harder. Um, yeah. So I totally agree with that. That's a really, that's really wise. Your dad's being very wise now that you're old enough to see that your dad has some wisdom. Now that I could take his point of view. This morning, I, I got out um, this old, and I'm saying old, 1987. I double-checked a oh, nice. um, book from Thich Nhat Hanh called Being Peace because I woke up to an email from the New York Times, which really annoyed me. <laughs> I'm like, how are you emailing me? I, I didn't give you, did I give you permission to email me about the, the things that are, the atrocities that are happening in our world right now? Yeah. And so this book dates back to 1987. Um, and Thich Nhat Hanh was writing during the Cold War. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's relevant, isn't it? Yeah. You could read from this book and it feels so, it feels the same, right? And many people that may be listening to this may have not lived through the Cold War, but I'm a child of the Cold War. The Cold War is like, yeah. you know, I just remember how that felt as a, yeah. as a child. And, um, and what he talks about in the book is sitting down with people and listening. Yeah. yeah. That's engaged practice. And one of the things that we have to do in order to sit down with another person is we have to let go of our sense of self as being separate. Yeah. Acknowledge our interdependence and really practice a different, like practice non-attachment, non-attachment yeah. to our belief system. Absolutely. When you sit down with a person your mind is, I mean, if they're different from you, especially, and they have different values than you or just different approach to life, your, your mind is going to be judging. You're going to want to get away. You're going to want to, you know, be critical. And, and so the hardest part is kind of being able to sit. Non-judgment is actually a pretty tricky part. Um, 
because you got to do a lot of that because people who are different from you are going, your, your ego is going to say, no, you've got to separate. That's bad. You know, so it, it really is letting go of your desire for everybody to be like you as well and to agree with you, which is a really non-egoic thing to do. Uh, there's a really, some really nice research in our uh, university where they look at helping teachers to support, I would describe it as support young people's values. That's the way I would describe it. They call it autonomy support, which is where the, the, instead of the, the, the teacher helps, listens to the student and, is, and is, learns to be on their side more, you know, what we call value clarification and motivational interviewing or whatever words you want to use. And when the teacher learns to do that, they're, I think they're putting evidence-based process into play. And what happens is really interesting. They never talk about aggression or bullying. They never talk about being a victim. But what happens is when you create, when the teacher creates an environment that's more focused on values and on recognizing the individual needs of each student, and what happens is the aggression goes down and the environment becomes less egoic. So let me tell you what that means, because that's kind of interesting, because we are, con we are about context, aren't we, Diana? So, we're, so to create an ego, if you want to create an egoic environment where there's tons of attachment and it increases aggression and conflict, here's what you do. You basically make things incredibly competitive. You hold up one, of the, one person as, this is an example, this person is awesome, with the implication that it's, why aren't you like that? And so you really reinforce hierarchy and status and then you get i believe that gets attachment ego and you get more aggression in those classrooms when you do that look at look at little uh look at lisa she's getting straight a's and she does this 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 why, why are you you guys should be like this that's egoic the non-egoic approach is much more about um recognizing that people are on their own journey that not holding one person up as everybody should be like that person just reducing that kind of, you know, you don't put people's grades on a wall and compare them to each other. You're just reducing that and kind of more emphasizing, like we were doing earlier in the podcast, that people are on their own journeys. And what you really want to be striving for is to be in three months, you know, better than the person you were three months ago, rather than better than this person or that person. And I think a really important feature of that is to emphasize what each individual uh, person brings to the table, which is always unique and not really comparable. That's a big push with the end of normal, like Steve Hayes' talk on end of normal. I encourage people to see those if they get a chance. But this whole idea of that, that there's a normal that everybody's supposed to be striving for is a modern idea. It wasn't present hundreds of years ago. Everybody has their unique strengths and talents and skills, and there is no average. You know what I mean? Like everybody's so different and brings such different things to the table. And so if you want to undermine attachment and ego in your environment, like if you're a teacher or a manager or even a therapist, you, you, I guess you want to minimize this idea that there is a ideal average person, like be like Bill Gates, be like this person or that person that you want to be like and more make it about not competition with other people, but maybe if you want to motivate yourself, I guess competition with your young, earlier self. Are you improving on your earlier self? And I think that undermines attachment to some extent. That's a, tr he that's a tricky one. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to nitpick a little. Okay. <laughs> Do you mind? Sure, of course. Um, being a better version of yourself can be a little, it can be a little slippery of a slope yeah, for yeah, folks. Yeah. And yeah. um kind of going back to some of Ty's teaching of your, your true nature is good. Yeah. 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 There's nothing to be improved here. You are not a self-improvement project. You are not a work in progress. There is nothing, yeah. there is nothing to be improved about who you are. Yeah. You are whole. Absolutely. And we can also continue to do and work on being a full expression of that goodness yeah. in the world. And how, how are we lining up with that? Because I just know for myself that would hook me because I'm like, was I better? Am I better than myself than I was uh, yesterday? Yeah, yeah, was that, I okay, so yeah, so we fall, I fall into the trap. <laughs> All of a sudden exactly. I'm selfing again. Exactly. I think you're absolutely right. Like that's, that's really deep and beautiful what you're saying. I, I, that's true. So I, I think one of the things about non-attachment is, is holding on to things that 
not holding on, that's the opposite of not, but recognizing things which seem to be totally contradictory. And how do you live in a life where there seem to be all these contradictions? Which I completely agree with you. And um, and people want to improve, but it doesn't mean that they aren't already complete and perfect and whole. Do you know what I mean? So how do you, you're absolutely right. So what I'm saying could be very trappy as well. And, and, and so this pool to attachment is ever present. And, and we need somebody like you saying exactly what you said, which is to remind us. But but actually, even if you don't aren't a better version of yourself, the, the act of living and, and, and doing what you're doing is, is, is enough. For me, it's, it's about understanding it in my body. Yeah. Because when you started talking about, um, like, be a better version of you. Yeah. I could feel it in my body first. Yeah. Like, ooh, I feel it's almost like a lean in, graspy, be a better version of me. I better hurry up to catch up to that version of me, you know? <laughs> and, and so I think that what, what I think we can start to do is pay attention to how it feels. Like, you know what graspiness feels like. Yeah. And when you're kind of wanting something and holding it tightly, you also yeah. know what it feels like in your body to let be. Like if yeah. you're watching your dog run through, like I walked my dog this morning and I let her off leash when we got to the lane and she just ran, yeah. like, like wild ran. And I had so much sympathetic joy for her. I was like, oh my gosh, th that is just beauty. I was not attached to it. I didn't need yeah. her to keep running. It was just being in the moment of it. Yeah. Right. So you know what it feels like in your body to experience non-attachment. Yeah, that's a good way. And attachment. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I've had a lot of that experience lately with things like I do martial arts. I do boxing. I play piano. I, um, you know, obviously I'm always trying to improve at lots of things. Um, but kind of just I'm get, I, and I know what it feels like to feel attached. Like I want to I want to be able to play this piece well or, you know, I want to be a. a a better, I want to be able to execute this attack. And there, so I know what that feels like. And it's different from just that, just seeking to improve in itself as a joy. Mm -hmm. And in self-determination theory talks about this need for competence. And the idea is that we ha all have a need to be effective and successful in the world. And I think that's inherently reinforcing, like not necessarily successful, but like just developing skill in itself, even, even not being attached to the end of, am I ever going to be able to do this difficult music? Am I ever going to be able to um, be this kind of athlete? Or am I ever going to, you know, like being able to enjoy the process without clinging to the outcome? I think I know, I agree with you that talking in terms of body, I, I know that distinction. It's very hard to talk about verbally though, mm -hmm. but I know when I'm like, oh gosh, this, am I, I, I just suck. I'm never going to get better. You know, that shows up for me. I'm like, God, how bad am I? Like, I have no natural talent at this to just kind of appreciating and enjoying that moment of trying to improve, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think you can sense it in your body for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the appreciation of of growth. It's like, you know, working with a, a kid that's learning how to read. You just yeah. see them getting better at it and it feels good to them because once they get better at it they want it they can read more and they move from like this like the books that have like three words per page to actually a book that's interesting yeah. and how that kind of growth is um that's not about because now they can say i can read it, it's yeah. about what what doors it opens up for yeah. them as yeah. they grow and it's just a different it's a different frame i guess a different way of seeing success or seeing striving yeah there's some um... improvement there's an interesting distinction in positive psychology, good, interesting line of research on harmonious passions, passion versus um, what's the other passion? It's kind of like a controlled or rigid kind of passion. So harmonious passion is where you're, what you're doing and, and striving for kind of fits in nicely with your life, you know? So maybe you want to be writing a new book, which I know you do, and uh, but you're able to do that and not necessarily, you know, now say somebody, a loved one wants to go out with you uh, to a meal or something. You're, you're able to like, let go of that writing to do something else and, and make it part of your life. Whereas the more controlled kind of passion um, is like, you know, the person who that has to dominate everything. They have to be good at this. Like the, it's like the dancer who continues to, um, train like 40 hours, 50 hours a week, even when they have an injury, you know what I mean? And they don't, and they, um, don't 
make space for other things in their life. That I think could be a bit more egoic. Like there's a, a movie called Whiplash. I don't know if you've seen this, but it's um person's just obsessed with being the greatest drummer of all time. And you can just see um, it's non-harmonious because just he just, just destroys, he harms his relationships. He puts other people down because it's all about that one thing of being the greatest drummer of all time. And it, it's a little bit, I think there's some ego in there. Um, and ego, I don't know. I don't know if ego is completely bad sometimes. I guess if it pushes you to strive, but it can, it can. I think you need to be able to let go of it when you need to let go of it. That's the key. I guess that that's a place that I'm in that maybe I can actually uh, ask a good consult on. Yeah. From you. Okay. Um, I can't write this book because <laughs> I cannot, I cannot write a book about striving without getting hooked by striving. So the behind the scenes of writing yeah. a book is you have to get an agent and in order to get an agent, you have to have not, like, really, they don't care about your ideas anymore. It's like how many followers you have. Yeah. And yeah. how can we live in this world that is driven by individualism and capitalism yeah. and striving and do it differently without, I mean, in some ways I, I have just put it on hold because I cannot, yeah. it's, it's like a, you know, like in 12 steps when they, they say an alcoholic that comes, comes up against alcohol, if they, if they meet it, they recoil as if from a hot flame. Yeah. And so I've learned that about myself. I need to recoil as from a hot flame because it's so dangerous for me. But I also want, I also feel like I have something to say and offer yeah. in this. Yeah. Gosh, it's so hard. So you're in academia. You're, you, you just described how you face that within academia. How do you, how are you doing? Yeah. It? So, I mean, I think the trick with the ego is that it's like thinking it's very future oriented a lot of times. Like, so I will be a great writer. I, I'm going to prove to them. I'm going to prove to the world. I'm going to be important. Um, I think the key is to kind of narrow your time frame way down. Like, so actually make it about, uh, tomorrow between 10 and 11, I'm just going to, I'm going to write, start writing this book. I'm just going to write for an hour and, and just focus in on the hour and your ego will try and pull you out and say, well, what the people are going to hate this. There's your ego. This is crap. I'm not saying I don't have anything interesting to say, you know, all that stuff is going to show up and you just need to kind of notice that's ego and just say, no, I made a commitment for an hour to write this, regardless of how bad it is, regardless of whether I actually get one sentence out or, or 5,000 words, I'm not even going to care if I have to throw it all away. So that's the non patch approach to striving right there. Like you're like, I have thrown away Louise Hayes and I have written a lot together and we will have thrown away entire books, like worth the material. Like it's pr probably about three to one, four to one, like four pages to one that's kept. It's, it's a it. terrible process, but you have to throw away a lot of stuff and you have to be willing to, and you have to be willing to feel stupid. You have to be willing to feel like you don't know anything and that you have to be willing to feel like, who am I to be doing this? So all that's going to show up in that one hour. And if an hour is too much, take it down to 10 minutes, just 10 minutes of total. This is like your non-attachment practice. We'll make it your non-attachment practice, writing a book on striving. <laughs> so oh, you start writing your book on striving, you're practicing it because like your mind is going to be attached to all kinds of things. Plus, what if you write something and you put it out in the world and everybody hates it and says it's crap? There you go again, another chance to practice non-attachment to ego. You know, and people will say that even if it's great, people will tell you it's crap. Another chance to practice non-attachment to ego. You know, so um, the more you strive, the more some people will be against you. Another chance to practice non-attachment to ego. You're going to feel like, no, they're against me because I'm really a bad writer or I'm not good enough. You need to let that go. Good enough, bad enough, all that. You know, so yeah, the, if you enter this arena called writing the book that you want to write, you are going to be practicing non-attachment um, all the time. So just treat it. Don't treat it as writing a book. Say, hey, this is my non-attachment practice. It's my non-attachment practice. And I like the hour part because it's how, how much of my life is it taking up? You know, as my yeah. dad said, like, be, be the embodiment of what you teach. Yeah. And if it's taking up and, and squeezing out other things that are of deep value to me, like working in my garden or being with my kids. Yeah. And maybe it's not, maybe it's a book that makes, needs to take 11 years to write until my nine-year-old nine -year yeah. is out of the house. Yeah. You know, and it's because it's an hour a day. 
So yeah, well, yeah. I mean, even that. See, even now, your mind jumps to eleven years. Uh, mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, see what I mean? Like that's it's just irresistible for us. And I'm I'm like this too. I, yeah. When I when I am be, I'm always being attached. So this is not something you ever cure or fix. By the way, um, I'm always feeling like God. Why do I? Why am I doing this? I'm a I'm a 54 year old guy trying to do a cartwheel into axe kick kind of martial arts and young kids are just doing it without even thinking about it. So if you really want to feel non-attached, do something that younger people are much better at and do it next to them. That's kind of an experience, but it all is about just showing up again. You know, maybe you have a half hour today, show up to it. And then tomorrow you're going to be like, Oh, I don't have any time. I'm going to put my child first. And that's harmonious passion. It's like, okay, that's what I'm going to do today. And just, but just keep showing up. Um, And those little steps will get you there. I don't know if it's 11 years or three, who knows? Don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, But if you can let go of that attachment to knowing the future, knowing how fast it will be, how slow it will be, let go of the attachment that it has, it should be done in three years or other people seem to do it in two years or this person had a child and they wrote a best selling book. No, that's that ego comparison of you should be like that other person. You know, when it, your life is completely unique and your passions and loves are completely unique, you know, they're yours and you're the only one who can find your way. There's only, there's a way for you that isn't the same for anybody else. Well, thank you. I think that that's a good place to end with those words. And I appreciate the personal consult there, but also oh. I think that we could apply it to People are wanting to write books, but they're wanting to do other things. They're considering going yeah. back to graduate school. They're considering making a job change. They're considering starting yeah. a family. You know, all these different things that that take time or we think that we're not ready for or we're not good enough mm-hmm. for or whatever. Yeah. Um, practicing non-attachment in that way with those different dimensions of our life can really free us up. Yeah, just the very yeah. act of engage, writing the book sometimes will be you practicing non-attachment. So it's not to practiced in the act of embodying your values. I think that's where it happens. I think that was a yeah. brilliant point you made. I really do like to see people who embody what they talk about. Well, thank you. I think you're doing that, Joseph, and um, appreciate the efforts that you are making in your life. You are, have had such a huge impact on many people's lives because it's you that impacts the research, that impacts the clinicians that are carrying out that research that is spread to many, many lives. Many people may not even know that you have influenced um, them, but you have. So, and I look forward to having you back because when you come back, we are going to really focus in on your new book, but it feels a little bit early in (laughs) this time of year, um, even though it's probably alive for you right now, but we'll be talking about that. Yeah, that's awesome. Yep. Appreciate it. Take care. Thank you.